I know Gear likes to start on time, so we will start on time. It is 6.30 in the West, 8.30 in the East. Um, thank you all for being here, a, a big welcome. Um, there are 85 plus people who are signed up tonight. So this is standing room only. So pretend you're in a crowded room and feeling very fortunate that you got a folding chair. Uh, and also that you don't have to wear a mask because this is all, all digitally uh, dispersed. Um, I'm gonna make a kind of a, just a brief overview of what's going on tonight. And we'll get right into the program because we have uh, an hour and we wanna use it well. I wanna thank the uh, Robinson Jeffers Association and the Tor House Foundation for sponsoring uh, our program tonight. Uh, Dr. Gear de Gazira for moving things along and turning this from talk into action. Uh, a step that he also often uh, manages for us. And uh, Jessica Hunt, who you can't see on screen, is our stage manager and uh, tech uh, master tonight. And as we get to the question process of this, she'll be taking your questions and feeding them forward uh, to me for the panel. A couple of quick uh, tech things. Uh, our group is large enough, uh, too large in fact, to have everyone on screen. So the panelists and I cannot see you when we cannot hear you. Your cameras and mics are off. So this is unfortunately kind of a one-way video audio feed. Uh, to offer a question or a comment, use the Q&A box uh, that's uh, at the bottom of the screen. If you scroll down to the bottom of the screen, it should pop up. Um, that will go to Jessica. She'll be forwarding the questions to me as we go forward. Um, if you're on Facebook, you can use the comment feature and the same thing will happen. The comments will, will be brought forward. We will get to as many of them as we can. Um, for what it's worth, uh, kind of why we're here tonight, uh, we're all aware that COVID has radically altered our ability to travel and congregate. And this seemed a time where uh, it made sense to experiment with some other ways of having conversations with each other about Jeffers and his work. Uh, and thus we're doing this webinar, uh, the first one, which is jointly sponsored by the two groups. Uh, we are anticipating that we will do one of these about every three months. So if this goes well tonight, and I think it will, uh, we'll be back uh, with maybe a, in the next quarter, another program and see if we can't make this a, a somewhat regular uh, procedure for us. Um, there are three panelists tonight. I'm going to keep the uh, introductions very, very brief because they're well known to you. Uh, Jim Carmen uh, is the president of the Robinson Jeffers Association and a trustee of Tor House, a uh, longtime Jeffers scholar. Elliot Ruckowitz Roberts, a uh, distinguished poet, president of the Tor House Foundation, longtime member of the Jeffers Association as well. Susan Schillinglaw, uh, one of our absolutely most distinguished Steinbeck scholars who's um, uh, willingly moving from Monterey to Carmel for the evening. Uh, she's long been interested in Jeffers and was for uh, a distinguished term director of the National Steinbeck Center. So these are your panelists for the evening. Um, the way the uh, discussion will go, I'm going to start by reading the poem so uh, we just kind of have it fresh in our mind. And then each of the panelists uh, will in order um, offer a kind of a brief introductory comment on the poem as a way of getting the discussion started or setting up the, uh, the context for the discussion. We'll then um, invite the panelists to take up whatever questions they have for each other. Uh, I may throw in a question or two just to keep people off balance. And as we're doing this, that would be a good time for those of you in the audience who have comments and questions that you would like to put into play to be feeding them to us through the, um, through the Q and A option. And then we'll be factoring those into the conversation as we go forward. Um, we will, I'm told uh, by the folks who, who count, uh, we will shut this off promptly at the end of an hour so that you can all go about your, your affairs. Fair enough? Okay. Now see, I, I have to pretend that you're all nodding yes out there in the audience because of course I can't see you. So 
I'm going to read uh, The Purse Sane by Robinson Jeffers, uh, a poem from 1935, um, a poem we all, I'm assuming, know. Our sardine fishermen work at night in the dark of the moon, daylight or moonlight, they could not tell where to spread the net, unable to see the phosphorescence of the shoals of fish. They work northward for Monterey coasting Santa Cruz, off New Year's Point or off Pigeon Point, the lookout man will see some lakes of milk color light on the sea's night purple. He points and the helmsman turns the dark prow. The motorboat circles the gleaming shoal and drifts out her sand net. They close the circle and purse the, the bottom of the net, then with great labor haul it in. I cannot tell you how beautiful the scene is and a little terrible then when the crowded fish know they're caught and wildly beat from one wall to the other of their closing destiny, the phosphorescent water to a pool of flame, each beautiful slender body sheeted with flame like a live rocket, a comet's tail wake of clear yellow flame while outside the narrowing floats and cordage of the net, great sea lions come up to watch sighing in the dark the vast walls of night stand erect to the stars. Lately, I was looking from a mountaintop, from a night mountaintop on a wide city, the colored splendor galaxies of light. How could I help but recall the same net gathering the luminous fish? I cannot tell you how beautiful the city appeared, but, or sorry, appeared and a little terrible, I thought. We have geared the machines and locked all together into interdependence. We have built the great cities now, there is no escape. We have gathered the vast populations incapable of free survival, insulated from the strong earth, each person in himself helpless on all dependent. The circle is closed and the net is being hauled in. They hardly feel the cords drawing yet they shine already. The inevitable mass disasters will not come in our time, nor in our children's, but we and our children must watch the net draw narrower. Government take all powers or revolution and the new government take more than all, add to kept bodies, kept souls, or anarchy, the mass disasters. These things are progress. Do you marvel our verse is troubled or frowning while it keeps its reason? Or it lets go, lets the mood flow in the manner of the recent young men into mere hysteria, splintered gleams, crackled laughter, but they are quite wrong. There is no reason for amazement. Surely one always knew that cultures decay and life's end is death. So Jim, you're gonna start us off. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our very first webinar, and thank you for joining us. I also wish to thank Tim Hunt and Jessica Hunt and Gear Zeraga for their work in planning this event and making it possible. For my opening five minutes, that's what uh, Tim assigned us, I have prepared a brief sketch of two topics I hope to examine at greater length during our open discussion. The first topic is limited in scope and concerns the story behind the Persane, as recounted by Yuna in a letter to Mabel Dodge Lewin dated October 1st, 1935. The letter contains specific information about Jeffers's adventure on board a newly built fishing vessel. vessel. Uh, the name of the ship the distance he traveled, the tonnage of fish hauled in, and other matters. I'll be happy to share this information as time allows. The second topic is more expansive and approaches the poem with the totality of Jefferson's vision of life in mind, with a particular concern for the image of the net in the Persane and in other poems. That image, I would argue, provides a key to understanding 
much of what Jeffers says about desire, religious faith, political systems, American culture, Western civilization, human nature, and the ultimate aim of human life. That's just about everything. <laughs> For this latter topic, I would like to briefly invoke a traditional mythic image from South Asia, Indra's net. Indra, as many of you know, was or is a sky god, popular in varying degrees through the centuries among Hindus, Buddhists, and Jains. One of Indra's prized possessions is a marvelous net that extends infinitely over, across, and through the universe in all directions. Everything that exists is held within that net. At every node or vertex, there is a brilliant jewel. Some say a diamond, some say a pearl that captures the reflection of every other jewel and all the reflections within those reflections ad infinitum. In Eastern religious traditions, the net signifies the interconnection and interdependence of everything that exists. Some passages in early Vedic literature also refer to Indra's net in more conventional terms as something that catches and holds phenomena and thereby, thereby functions as a trap. What does Indra's net have to do with Jeffers and our understanding of the Percy? First, the ancient non-Western idea of cosmic interconnectedness and interdependence serves as an, an illuminating analog to Jeffers's 20th century worldview. As Jeffers says in his letter to Sister Mary James Power, written October 1st, 1934, just a year before he composed the Percy, I believe that the universe is one being. All its parts are different expressions of the same energy, and they are all in communication with each other, influencing each other. Therefore, parts of one organic whole. This is physics, I believe, Jeffers adds, as well as religion. Second, the jewels in Indra's net, like every poem, or I should say, like the jewels in Indra's net, every poem written by Jeffers reflects all the others. Accordingly, images and ideas found in the Persane repeat important central insights found throughout his verse, from flagons and apples to the beginning and the end. And third, the image of a net functioning as a trap helps us better understand what was at stake for Jeffers when he said over and over in different ways that our main task in life is to break through the entanglements of human self-centeredness, to see through the delusions that grip us and others, and to open ourselves to an experience of the transhuman magnificence of the greater world. If the internet is the per sane of our time, if the very technology we are using right now is in fact a life-destroying trap, despite what the CEOs of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google said before Congress earlier today, then Jefferson's poem is a vital, urgent warning that we and everyone else should heed. Thank you, Jim. Elliot. Is there anything else to say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> that, that was wonderful. I, uh, and and uh, as with Jim, I'd like to uh, thank Tim and Jessica and Gear for putting this together. Uh, wouldn't have happened without them. So I'm going to look at a, a slightly uh, look at um, the Persane uh, from a slightly different image, and uh, it's uh, the I titled the piece "Sighing in the Dark." 
closing the circle, a reading of the first same. And it raises some questions and, and leaves a lot of loose ends, hopefully, which people will pick up for us to discuss. The first scene is for me, in many ways, a stunning poem. It's preciseness of diction, <clears throat> the descriptive brilliance, the compelling imagery, the narrative structure, the prof prophetical insight, which makes it such a relevant poem today. Yet each time I read the Persane, for reasons I could never explain, the image that resonated the most with me was this one. Outside the narrowing floats and cordage of the net, great sea lions come up to watch, sighing in the dark. Sighing in the dark. The image stops me every time I read the poem. Yet until now, I have not thought much about it, perhaps heeding Jeffrey's advice <clears throat> in return about being a little too abstract, a little too wise. But when one does look, think about it, how uncharacteristic of sea lions. Certainly Jeffers knew the barking of the sea lions from the rocks below Tor House and from Point Lobos. He would have also heard the hoarse grunting sounds of the males and the squeal, the belch, the growl of the females, but sighs? And to hear those above the engines of the big Persaner ambassador from which Jeffers observed the event he describes? Despite everything which makes the image problematic, it remains for me compelling. And what I would like to explore is why this might be so. There is in the Persaner a complex interplay between the narrator poet, the reader, the you of the poem, and the they. The first word of the poem, our, establishes a relationship between the narrator and the reader, a relationship which is immediately set apart from the sardine fishermen themselves, the they who could not tell where to spread the net. Jeffers begins the second stanza by directly addressing the reader, I cannot tell you. As in the first stanza, narrator and reader, the our, the I and you stand apart from and outside the action, observers first to the work of the sardine fishermen and then to the terrible yet beautiful scene of the fish caught in the Persane net. Jeffers follows the same pattern in the third stanza. The I recounts his personal experience. Lately, I was looking down from a night mountain top and then addresses the reader. I cannot tell you how beautiful the city appeared. Then the you and I become we. We have geared the machines. And this we is set apart from the vast populations that they who hardly feel the cords drawing. We remain outside the net. We and our children must watch the net draw narrower. Are we then like the great sea lions watching and sighing in the dark? And does this we include the narrator poet? He also sighing in the dark. Do you marvel, he asks, our verse is troubled or frowning while it keeps its reason? No barking, grunting, squealing, growling, unless in the manner of the recent young men into mere hysteria, splinted gleams, cracked laughter. While the great sea lions, the I, the you, the we are outside the sardine fishermen's persane, outside the net that encloses the vast populations in our cities, all are ultimately enclosed in the vast walls of night that stand erect to the stars. Did Jeffers envision the vast walls of night as the persane in larger scale? The trapped sardines we recall widely beat from one wall to the other of their closing destiny. If so, what then is our closing destiny? There is no reason for amazement, Jeffers writes, perhaps playing on an obsolete meaning of amazement, frenzy, and using for the first time, first and only time in the poem, the indefinite pronoun one. There is no reason for amazement, Surely one always knew that culture's decay and life's end is death. There is both the truth of the consequences that befall the world we have created, what we call progress, but also the wider truth of our mortality. This wider truth until the last line of the poem barely referenced. Is it possible 
that Jeffers the poet as distinct from the eye of the poem has drawn the purse saying around each of us, catching us by surprise with this last clause of the poem. Thank you, Elliot. Mark Elliot. Susan. Well, I too want to thank um, Tim and Jessica and Gear, and I'm honored to be a part of this, pa um, this panel. I want to cast my comments um, in the context of Steinbeck and his friend Ed Ricketts, both of whom were very profoundly impacted by Jeffers' poem, Poems and Poetry. Um, in 1935, the year this poem was written, uh, Steinbeck wrote a poet. Uh, reporter that Jeffers poetry is perfect to me. Um, and in 1937, uh, when it was published, he says that Jeffers should have the Nobel Prize. Uh, so I'm going to make some points about the poem and then draw comparisons between what Jeffers wrote and what Steinbeck was doing at about the same time. The first is the title. Um, I think that the Persane is a net, it's a Persane or is a ship, but I think casting a net um, certainly evokes uh, a kind of biblical context or certainly bi biblical resonance for this poet um, because of course being um, we think of Jesus talking to Peter and saying please, please come be a fisher of men so the con the connections between being a fisher of sardines and of men I think is part of the poem as well. And it's something Steinbeck does as well, of course, in something like The Grapes of Wrath, where uh, the whole journey of the Jodes evokes Exodus going from, a, from the desert to the promised land. It's not, um, it's not explicitly made um, apparent, but it's suggested in the, in the novel. My second point is about the first stanza and the emphasis on work. Um, when I see our sardine, um, Fisherman as the opening words of this poem. For me, it's a local connection, um, the sense of regional, being a regional poet, the intimacy of the observer and knowing um, the scene that he's describing. Um, and the sardine fisherman that he's describing, I think he admires very much for their um, commitment to work and to great labor. Um, you see the dignity and the integrity of work also articulated in the other poems in this suite of poems, this Windstruck Music and Coast Road. And I think that's something that Steinbeck is always celebrating, the kind of dignity of work, working with your hands, etc. cetera. Um, and so to focus first on the scene with the fishermen working, I think is, is important um, at the specificity of that scene. Um, the lookout man, um, I, I take it as also being a sort of evoking the poet later who's going to look out on the mountaintop. What this poem does for me in the repetitions of the words and some of the images, um, like work and labor, later I cannot tell you, um, flames, etc. It's kind of creating a net with the words and the, how the words link. And so the poem itself becomes a net too. And drawing on what Jim said, I think that these, he's working with this whole idea of the net um, working in different contexts. Um, my third point is um, about kind of connecting this whole idea of workers and the net um, and fishing. Uh, because Steinbeck has a very similar passage in Sea of Cortez describing shrimp trawlers who are dredging the bottom of um, the uh, uh, the sea near Guaymas. This is at the end of the trip when he's drawing his comments together about what the Sea of Cortez trip that he took in 1940 with Ed Ricketts means. Um, and he writes, uh, describing the scene of fishermen, the big scraper closed like a sack as it came up and finally it deposited many tons of animals on the deck, tons of shrimps, but also tons of fish of many varieties and then he names them. And he concludes, the waste of this good food supply was appalling. So again, it's a scene that's both appalling and mesmerizing for Steinbeck, echoing, I think, um, some of what Jeffers is doing um, uh, with his description of the scene. And in both instances, because I think finally the fishermen are part of this 
net of humanity and of the cosmos and of um, the cities that um, they're good men caught up in a system that is, um, that is bad. Uh, as Steinbeck says, we like the people on this boat very much. They were good men, but they were caught up by a large and destructive machine, good men doing a bad thing. So I think there's an interesting comparison to make um, in those two passages. Um, Steinbeck was very much influenced by Jeffers in his statements in Sea of Cortez. Ricketts says that Steinbeck in trying to articulate um, the holistic appreciation, he said it was grounded in Jeffers' thought. So the culmination of Sea of Cortez, Steinbeck is drawing from um, Jeffers. I think you see that particularly in the whole notion of the net, uh, what Jim, again, what Jim was talking about, the walls of the net um, that are enclosing the fish are also the walls of night that go up to the cosmos. They stand direct to the stars. So, and then of course there's the net that encloses the city. So all of those nets are in essence one. Um, in Sea of Cortez, when Steinbeck is describing um, holistic appreciation, he says that all things are one thing and that one thing is all things. Plankton, a shimmering phosphorescence on the sea and the spinning planets and an expanding universe all bound together by the elastic string of time. It's advisable to look from the tide pool to the stars and then back to the pool, tide pool again. That string makes another kind of net. And I think perhaps consciously, perhaps not, he's picking up on some of Jeffers imagery here. And finally, I think as we move from the scene to the statement, um, Jeffers like Steinbeck is, assumes a kind of detached perspective when he looks from the top of a mountain down on the city. And I think that's you know, the perspective that was really imp important to Jeffers as the commentator, to Steinbeck who cultivated this detached perspective, to Ricketts the scientist who also said he wanted a detached perspective that you pull back a little bit. So that um, when you look at the, um, the people caught in the net um, in the city, um, I think it becomes, of course, a comment on the modern condition and uh, for, for Jeffers to take on this sort of very broad statement about how we're caught in this, um, this endless system that, that is destroying us. Um, Steinbeck makes similar comments about entanglement also at, at Guaymas when he's summing things up about the trip. Um, his net is described as 110 volt power units and winding dirt roads and the high voltage um, power um, will be a network of wires and will draw people into the web, um, whether it be Asiatic Russia, rural England or in Mexico. In other words, rural communities will be ruined by the web, which will bring them into the mo modernity in the modern world. So he uses some of the same um, imagery that Jeffers does, I, you know, whether he was thinking about this poem or not, I don't know. And then finally, I think life's end is death. Um, there is a sense not of despair there, but just acceptance of this whole scene is part of um, the cycle of um, decay and destruction and eventually rebirth, which Steinbeck also believed in. I want to stop there because I think that's my minutes. So if you have questions. So questions that uh, the three of you have for each other. We'll start there. Why don't you have a question for any <laughs> of us? I have a, a sort of a general comment. I, I'm, I'm trying to think of, I mean, there, there are interesting ways in which the, um, the presentations diverge, but there are also interesting ways in which they intersect and, and um, and, and interact. And one of the things that I I'm, I'm find myself um, not, not struggling with, but trying to make sense of is the whole notion of being inside or outside the net uh, in the way the poem works. So, uh, you know, Eliot with the, uh, the sea lion, there's a sense of the sea lion is outside the net. Um, 
but if Jeffers is one of uh, the humanity caught in the changing circumstance, is he in the net as well as outside the net? Um, in other words, are, are we looking at a, at a privileged position where he looks out on this and passes judgment on it? Or are we looking at um, a poet who is sensing that he's caught up in this as well as being able to stand back and comment on it? So is it either or, is it both and? Uh, does the net help us there? Um, does the issue of work help us there? Uh, I'm, I'm just, there's more, what, what you're pointing out, the three of you in different ways is that while the poem on the surface of it seems a fairly simple set of statements, why it seems to continue to compel us is that it's drawing us into a very complex relationship to these things. Well, I like Susan's uh, point about uh, perspective and Jeffers being detached. And, uh, and that poses, you know, for me, what I thought became an issue in the poem is that if we look at the very last and life's end is death, I mean, where does that come from? You know, if you look at the poem, it's just kind of just boom, right there. And in a way, uh, it's, you know, I think, as, as I try to suggest, that's the greater net that's we're caught in this net of life, which ends in death. Uh, and Jeffers recognizes that he's in, he, he may distance himself from what's happening, you know, with progress, but he can't distance himself from that. Uh, and at the very end, it seems to me that he's kind of, he's kind of trapped us in this net. You know, here we are, we're, like, we're, we're with him observing uh, you know, what we call progress. Then, you know, he, he brings it back to us. Well, surely you knew you were going to die. Um, so for I, me, I, I'll go ahead. I'm sorry, Elliot. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Susan. Yeah. I mean, I kind of connect the lookout man and the great sea lions coming to watch. And then I was looking. So you have a man looking, a sea lion looking, and then the poet looking but they're all finally contained in the vast wall of night that stands erect to the stars, which is another net. And so we're all in this, all everybody looking from our perspective, we're all in this together. And so that that's, you know. So there's a specific net, but also figural nets that operate at larger frames to kind of come back around to, uh, to Jim's point. Um, I, I found myself wondering, um, um, something that might be fun to do, not tonight, but I'll throw this out to our friends in the, uh, in the audience. Uh, it would be interesting to talk about this poem at some point in connection to Boats in a Fog, which is a little earlier, but again, involves uh, fishing. And I'm thinking also of uh, Point Joe, where we have the, uh, the man gleaning, uh, where that kind of work uh, is seen as being part of almost unselfconsciously within nature, where the speaker of the poem is always consciously watching this other frame. So this brings us back to the, to the observer again. So observer, participant, they're two different aspects of a more complex but single position within his imagination. With the uh, comments that were made in observations about the work and um, the workers and uh, the activity of, of, uh, of fishing, uh, let me just provide some interesting background material just because it, it does um, provide another layer of understanding. Uh, apparently Jeffers wanted to go out on this uh, adventure, as Yuna says, um, to collect material for his verses. So uh, he already had an idea in mind of what he might find. And he arranged to go out with a friend, uh, Noel Sullivan, who it turned out um, didn't show up and Jeffers went out by himself. And he was supposed to be back by midnight. Uh, but um, Yuna went to bed at midnight and he wasn't home and woke up in the morning and he wasn't home and discovered after um, uh, running back and forth to uh, um, uh, 
Pacific Grove and beyond in Monterey, that he had gone out on a, an especially large per seine uh, that went all the way up to Half, Half Moon Bay, which is about 100 miles from Carmel. And um, the whole crew, and apparently all the crew members, were Italian. Uh, I don't know if Jeffers was able to um, retrieve any of his college Italian when he was studying in Zurich, but uh, he might have found a way to communicate with some of them. Uh, Yuna could not communicate with them at all, so she was frantic. He eventually uh, returned home at 3 p.m. The, ne the next day, and uh, one of the first things he told her about was the, the phosphorescence of the fish. And just one other um, item of information that uh, uh, fits in somewhere is that the, um, uh, the ship brought in 70 tons of sardines, which was a huge catch, um, uh, a lot of death for those uh, little fish. And it certainly was one of the, the ships that helped lead to the um, collapse of the sardine fishery within a few short years. By 1945, it was almost over, and certainly by the 50s, um, there were no sar sardines at all to be found. Right. Uh, so Jeffers um, really did witness an industry uh, that was um, uh, doing great damage uh, to uh, uh, the area where he lived, but he found it fascinating, and uh, he did, in fact, um, gather material for his verse. Interesting. Yeah, but he's also very selective, right? Because when they put out that persane, it's not just sardines. And, and Susan, I think you talked about going out in, in a note uh, and watching all the birds and the, I mean, it's not calm. You've got animals all over the place. So he's tailoring, you know, the description to meet his, you know, his thematic needs. Um, sure. Yeah, well, and his perception is also going to be shaped by those thematic needs too, uh, you know, in the same way. Shall we go ahead and, and bring in some of the comments and questions from- I have, I have one more thing to add, oh, Tim. Just, just reflecting on what you said, there's a, um, you know, Rachel Carson's first book is Under the Sea Wind, published in 1941, and she has a great description of a scomber, one of her animals that she describes as caught in a purse saying your net as well. And so that becomes a real central image in that book as well, an environmental sort of, you know, it, well, it's about life and death and the, what, what this, what this um, mackerel faces. But it would be interesting to do all these net, you know, sort of <laughs> people, writers talking about nets and what, how they extrapolate from that. So. There, there's your next book project. <laughs> We actually have a comment, Elliot, about uh, the sea lion uh, from uh, William Gilly. He says, sea lions will come in and out of the persane as it is pulled in. They are the dancers whose survival depends on the timing of leaving the net at the right time. Maybe they're out of breath from all the swimming. <laughs> <laughs> well, out of breath is different from sighing. Uh, well, I'll, I'll let, uh, let you argue that. That was <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. I will argue it. Okay share that comment. Um, we, uh, the, the questions are fairly interesting uh, and some of them aggregate together, but I'm, I'm just gonna kind of grab a couple. Doug uh, Borer uh, says, if um, Yuna could hold a seance and we could uh, talk to Robinson, um, what question would you each want to ask him about this poem? I have one. Okay. I want to know specifically who are the recent young men into mirrors, hysteria, splintered gleams, crackled laughter. Which men, young men, is he referring to? That would be fun, wouldn't it? I, I think I know the answer to that. Do you? I, I think he was referring uh, to the um, post World War I generation of British poets. That's what I thought, Elliot and Pound. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yes, certainly the, the, there was a, a, he and Yuna in their letters discuss the um, hysterical reaction in the breakdown within poetry that occurred just after World War I. And I think that's what he has in mind there. 
mm -hmm. and beyond. And well, answer the question. I think I just thank Jeffers for the poem. I don't. I'm not sure I have any uh, any questions I'd want him to answer. <laughs> okay. Now, now that that's a true poet uh, showing uh, deep respect to the master. Uh, I, I I applaud that answer there. Okay. Uh, Jim, do you have a question you want to pitch? You would pitch. I don't know. Um, I'll pass on that one. Okay. I. Thank you, Doug, for a tough question. Uh, I, at, uh, at some point, I, I can come back and um, uh, share something in, in, uh, in regard to Susan's co co uh, comment about the net image and Jeffers, perhaps, um, mindfulness of its relation to the, the, the Christian story, uh, because um, I think there's a direct connection between um, uh, the biblical view, Jeffers' understanding of uh, the Christian tradition and um, how that uh, relates to the first saint. Um, right. I can share that at any time. Okay. Several uh, people, uh, Linda Sayre for one, Peter Surchuk for another, are, are basically asking us um, about what they take to be a fairly bleak view of progress in the overall human position, which I'm guessing we don't think has improved radically since 1935. Um, that, that was my editorial comment. Um, how, how, do we, how do we respond to that? Is this, is this poem just uh, despair or uh, is this poem um, helping us cope? I don't know that it's gonna help us radically change things. And there, Kind of how does this poem translate into the current moment, I think, is, is what several people are, are wondering about. Well, it all depends on if, if you um, finally come to see the uh, hopeful and positive dimension of Jeffers' message to us and to all generations. Um, in his unpublished preface, to the double X, uh, he, he says again, um, turn outward from each other so far as need and kindness permit to the vast life and inexhaustible beauty beyond humanity. This is not a slight matter, but an essential condition of freedom and of moral and vital sanity. Very important for our time right now. Then here's the next connection. It is understood, he's saying, that this attitude is peculiarly unacceptable at present, being opposed not only by tradition, but by all the currents of the time. And here's the connection between the, per, uh, the double acts and the per saying. We are now completely trapped in the nets of envy, intrigue, corruption, compulsion, eventual murder that are called international politics. Right. And he goes on to say, um, we're in the net. I mean, he, he puts us all inside that net. But for him, the only way out is to uh, look beyond uh, the confi confinements of uh, modern life and uh, touch base once again with the larger world. So I never find his, his worldview pessimistic or depressing. Um, I always see it as providing a way toward um, affirmation and uh, hope. Well, you know, in a way, in way of understanding the vast walls of night that stand erect to the stars within the poem, because that takes our gaze for a moment upward and beyond the immediate scene to the larger beauty. True, exactly. In this particular poem. And, and maybe Jeffers answers Peter's question directly in going to Horse Flats, which yeah. appears in such councils you gave to me, where Jeffers meets the old man in the woods who, who wants to, who, who reads, you know, about all the horrible things that are happening in the world. And, uh, and Jeffers uh, says, um, why do we invite the world's rancors and agonies into our minds, the walking in a wilderness? Why did he want the news of the world? He could do nothing to help nor hinder. 
nor you, nor I can for the world. It is certain the world cannot be stopped nor saved. It has changes to accomplish and must creep through agonies toward new discovery. It must and it ought. The awful necessity is also the sacrificial duty. Man's world is a tragic music and is not played for man's happiness. Its discords are not resolved, but by other discords. There is real solution. Let him turn from himself and man to love God. He is out of the trap then. He will remain part of the music, but will hear it as the player hears it. Excellent, Elliot. And I would say trap in that last line is another word for net. Right. Okay. Um... Just a, a footnote on that. Ricketts wrote a, an essay called The Spiritual Morphology of Poetry. And he has um, four categories of poets. Jeffers is mentioned in the most complex final two. And his last category is called an all vehicle mellow poet, which is the most awkward title you could possibly imagine. But he says that Jeffers signpost is finally the sort of response to um, despair that at length you will look back along the stars rays and see that even the poor doll humanity has a place under the heaven. But now you're free even to become human. So I think you know that informs the sense of even with all of the lapses of humans, they're still a part of the whole, um, and that gives us solace. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I make a, a general comment here about how this is going because this is an experiment for all of us. We've we've not done this before. Uh, we're getting a robust number of questions and comments. Uh, actually, more than I can throw into the conversation, which I, I think is good, um, you know, given that we, that we have that much uh, involvement. It's also a little frustrating because we're not gonna get to everything that, that's being, uh, being raised here. Uh, we will, uh, I should note, be posting uh, this recording uh, on our websites, the RJA and the Tor House Foundation websites and making that link available. I, I think we will on RJA, I guess I shouldn't presume on Tor House, but. Uh, we can make this link available. Um, I would, uh, I, I think maybe Jim and Elliot, we should query the members and make sure that uh, they're okay if, or ask permission to uh, quote the comments and questions as an addendum to it, because then that way, uh, maybe we can start a further dialogue around the poem based on this discussion, the questions that we are able to get to but then also people could review and respond to the questions that we're not necessarily going to be able to fully address this evening. That's something we could talk about later, but maybe people in the audience could be uh, thinking about that. Uh, we have a question here for Susan from Richard Drake. She says, Jeffers influenced, he says rather, Jeffers influenced Steinbeck. Did the influence go the other way? Did Jeffers think about Steinbeck's work, particularly Grapes of Wrath? Um, I don't. I don't think so to the extent that um, Steinbeck thought about Jeffers. Um, you know, Jeffers was older. He got um, 15 years older. And I know that uh, he was given copies of Steinbeck's first two books um, yeah. or Pastors of Heaven and Two of God Unknown, second, third and fourth books. And so he may have read them, but um, when they met in 1938, they weren't particularly didn't have much to say to one another, but that's often the case when you get authors together. Um, so I, I think that, you know, Steinbeck and Ricketts were, they memorized Jeffers. They were pretty much fascinated with him. So I don't think that it was the same for Jeffers. Right. We have a comment from Alice uh, Yananishi. Um, not a question, but a comment. I have seen the seals, otters, pelicans, seagulls form a net to circle a school of fish and force them to the shore. It's not only the humans, it's not all humans that form nets. I thought that was a, uh, something we wanted to make sure we, we noticed. Um, let's see. This is from your, your Susan, your colleague, Alan Saldowski at San Jose. Um, 
and it, it somewhat, I think, builds on, on your use of, uh, or your comments about some of the biblical imagery. I'm wondering um, the prophetic stance that Jeffers takes in the, in the poem and how he constructs his extended trope of the net. He situates himself as the poem's speaker on the mountaintop like Moses, and he sees the water as a pool of flame in which the fish are sheeted with flame like, live, like a live rocket. The image here is one that suggests a cosmic apocalypse with the comet's tail of yellow flame. How do you, I'm addressing this to the panel as a whole, how do you see this imagery metaphor in terms of Jeffers' vision of what's in store for us in the immediate, in the immediate future? He also says the mass disasters won't come in our time nor our children's. So are we experiencing the mass disasters now that Jeffers anticipates in the poem? Wow, Alan, thanks for asking five questions. <laughs> that's, that's complicated. Okay, I'm telling you. <laughs> Go ahead, Elliot. No, that, uh, that's, that's okay. Um, well, Jim was going to talk about the religion too, so. Yeah, maybe, maybe Jim, would you want to talk about, since you raised the issue of the, uh, the biblical reference? No. Um, one of the, the poems where uh, Jeffers makes uh, considerable use of net imagery uh, is Dear Judas. And it's pretty much uh, the same language. Um, when uh, the woman who is identified as Mary uh, appears early on, she, said, um, she says, I bid you fishermen mending brown nets on the white sand I bid you beware of the net, fisherman. You never can see it. It flies through the white air, and we all are snapped in it. No, but look around you. You see men walking, and they seem to be free. But look at the faces. They're caught. There never was a man cut himself loose. That's true, but comfortless. Um, a net, we're all in a net. Jesus, in the course of the poem, says, I loathed my life. I was taken in a net. Mary says, um, the surest caught fish twists in the net and babbles to others, the cords cutting his gills. I have come to save you. Um, anyway, it goes on and on like that, where um, it's clear that the biblical image that Susan refers to is uh, uh, turned around and becomes literally diabolical in, uh, in Dear Judas, where um, religion itself, and specifically Christianity, is a net um, uh, cast by uh, a mad prophet, and those who are um, entangled in it um, ought to find a way uh, to get out. It's his most direct and um, damning poem about religion, I think, that he wrote. But it's very direct, and he makes use uh, extensively throughout. Uh, those were just some of the references uh, to the way um, religion is a net uh, that traps us. And I think it's interesting what he's doing with light in the poem. So I, you know, would have to think through it more. But I think the it is apocalyptic. Um, but and certainly, you know, the, will the world end in fire or ice? But I, there's also that sense that the the fish are like flames, the phosphorescent is like fame flames, and the comet is like a flame. And it's again one of these images, like Steinbeck with the tide pool to the stars. He's always reaching for the the local and specific and the and the cosmic. So, and I think that Jeffers keeps stretching us in that way, and so the flame goes goes upward um so um which makes it both local and apocalyptic right well it's it's fairly typical with with jeffers that you have this interplay between microcosm and macrocosm mm -hmm. you move back and forth so that we get flame kind of on different different levels that would be another another instance of that <clears throat> i've often felt that Emerson, who he claims he, he did not have much interest in. Uh, I think Emerson, that, that's an Emersonian uh, habit of mind that I, I think he, he picked up from 
Emerson and likes to uh, pretend he did not. But <laughs> can't know that. Maybe, maybe if we had the seance, I could ask him uh, if he wanted to fess up to uh, uh, his his interest in in um, in Emerson. Now, here's here's a, a comment that uh, I, I have to share because it, it it pleases me. Uh, Doug Bohr, can we propose extending this for thirty minutes? And uh, uh, I'm going to uh, say that in, in the spirit of, of the instructions that we were given for the evening, that no, we can't do that. Um, but I would, would hope that that means that uh, there's enough um, sense of this kind of dialogue can be good for our collective enterprise and our sense of community as people interested in Jeffers that we would want to do this sort of thing again, uh, and just get a little more more practiced at it, and especially in this time where we can't travel so much, however much Jeffers might abhor the internet, uh, that we exploit the hell out of it uh, to our, our best uh, ability. Um, we have a comment here from Brett uh, Colasico. In the repeated line, I cannot tell you how beautiful and a little terrible does the beauty outweigh the terror does the, and does the beauty in some sense justify the terror? Uh, that is a tough question. That's, that is a tough question. I'll go with the beauty. <laughs> um, it, is, it is terrible, but uh, in, from Jeffers' point of view, uh, life is good. I think they're yoked together and inseparable in some ways. So the um, that the sort of sublime and the feelings that the heightened feelings are the very part of the beauty and the terror that they're they're you can't, they're inseparable. Um, that we're both awed by it and horrified at it at the same time. And that complex, you know, that complex response is really what the poem is trying to convey. And although we're not talking about it here, um, it, it extends into the narrative poems and in his understanding of what he's doing in narrative. In other words, the, the self-torturing figure which releases the awareness of beauty in spite of the terror. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. that, that's another dimension. Let me respond to several comments. First, uh, Susan, uh, Debbie Sharp wants you to know that the twins were reading The Grapes of Wrath when they were traveling in Ireland in 1929. Oh, really? Oh, wow. There you go. Okay. okay. And so. then uh, Aaron was wondering about, you know, the troubling that, you know, you can't find um, uh, reaching for elements of hope. And, and I think with, with all of Jeffrey's poetry, you know, when he puts his books together, they're put together and all the poems are there for a reason. And so if you look at such councils as you gave to me, uh, you've got, uh, you know, you've got the, all these other wonderful poems like October Weekend. Uh, you've got uh, later, later on in it, you, you've also got um, poems like Oh Lovely Rock in it. So, um, you know, it's, it's all of a whole and, and the poem doesn't necessarily present the totality of Jeffrey's views. Uh, you know, this I think is a really important um, statement here. But you get a different, a slight, a different perspective when you read, uh, you know, when you read uh, "Oh, Lovely Rock," because right. the beauty, the beauty is emphasized. So, I'll, um, my closing words would be uh, to to come back to the image of the stars that uh, in the walls of the stars that we've mentioned before and the beauty and the sublime that uh, Susan just mentioned and the interconnection of, of, of everything with everything else. Uh, these lines come from the women at Point Sur and they're at a point where Jeffers is speaking for himself. He's not, um, uh, these are not Reverend Barclay's words and he's talking about the stars and their beauty and the way they shine and through their shining, the way they speak although to us it's silently. And he says, there is nothing but shines, though it shine darkness, nothing but answers. They are caught 
in the net of their voices, though the voices be silence. They, that's the stars and the moon and the sun, are woven in the nerve warp. And then he brings everything else in as well. One people, the stars and the people. One structure, the voids between stars, the voids between atoms, and the vacancy in the atom, in the rings of the spinning demons, are full of that weaving. One emptiness, one presence. The great net that holds us all, whether it's the sardines or the fishermen uh, or the, uh, the stars um, that shine in the sky. In fact, as Jeffrey says, uh, we're all one. So we are now at our time limit. So I'm going to thank you all for coming and say that I think if nothing else, uh, we're all gonna go back and reread this poem in a much richer and more engaged way. And we have lots to think about. Thank you to the panel. Uh, I and thank you to all of you who attended. Uh, I, by the way, have most of your questions in a log and I will try to respond to some of them um, if I can, uh, where I, where I, as much as I can over the next couple of days, and maybe we can post this conversation. Thank you. Good night. Uh, we'll see you again at some point, and we'll do this again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Thank you.